Hey, I'm Nick, creator of Canna Cribs and Growers Network, where we have educated millions of people on how to elevate their craft. I have toured some of the largest grow operations, befriended the best growers, and built a network of the top cannabis companies. Join me on this next adventure where I document history with the pioneer shaping the global cannabis industry in real time. Welcome to the Canna Cribs Podcast. Hey, welcome back to the Canna Cribs Podcast. I'm your host, Nick Morin. And today's interview is with Paul Rately, the CEO and co-founder of Chemistry. And in this interview, Paul talks to us about how he got his PhD in organic chemistry from Berkeley, the motivating factors of why he got into the cannabis industry, what it's like operating in California today in 2020, and how his teachers, vapes, and concentrates differentiate in the California marketplace. Enjoy. Before we dive into this episode, I want to talk about protecting your cannabis business. This is not really a topic that a lot of people are talking about, but with all the states that are going recreational and medical all across our country, it is more important now than ever to protect your cannabis company and all of your assets. We are, at the end of the day, an emerging industry, and that comes with emerging risks. So companies like Hub Insurance are here to help you. And my personal friend, Jim Clements at Hub Insurance is here to help you and your entire team. They have over 120 specialists that are dedicated to servicing our industry. And believe it or not, they have over 400 cannabis businesses that are already using their services. You can check them out at hubinternational.com. And I'm gonna go ahead and link Jim's email. I'm gonna even link his phone number. He does not know that. (laughs) I'm gonna link his phone number in the description below so you can reach out to him if you have any insurance needs. Now on with the episode. Hey, Paul, welcome to the Candy Cribs Podcast. Hey there, Nick. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having me. Definitely. I'm really excited today to dive into your background, your brand uh, at Chemistry. Uh, could you tell me how you stumbled upon the, the wonderful industry of cannabis? It's been a long journey to get here. So I'm a, a Badger originally, a Wisconsinite. I grew up north of Milwaukee and then went to Madison, University of Wisconsin-Madison for my undergrad, um, mm-hmm. where I got my bachelor's in chemistry. And there I had some really great mentors and um, advisors that encouraged me to keep going. Uh, I wasn't ready for a job. Um, originally, being from the Midwest, I thought I'd just move on to Chicago, but uh, luckily had some good people to say there's there's a world beyond the Midwest and yeah. encouraged me to apply to grad schools all over the country. And I was fortunate to get into Berkeley. And so I moved west <clears> and <throat> came to Berkeley and did five years uh, work in the lab in Berkeley on my PhD. And from there, uh, I was ready for a job. <laughs> yeah. So from there, I went into the biotech pharmaceutical world. And I'd always been a cannabis enthusiast and consumer Um, throughout grad school. It certainly helped me get through. Mm. (laughs) Um, And yeah, as you know, the market was evolving in the early 2010s and into the middle of that decade, we're just watching to see how things were evolving and regulations were starting to be formed and things were happening besides just smoking weed and making hash and yeah so i saw how people were making products and what they were doing and and also of course the medicine seeing how clinical studies were evolving and and really started digging myself on you know what what maybe i could do in this world mm-hmm. and then i had a daughter in 2014 and that kind of changed my whole world view i was ready for a big change and really wanted to make sure i was doing something in my life that really fulfilled me on all angles i, I learned mm-hmm. so much at gilead and did a lot of amazing research, worked with great people. Um, you know, I worked on HIV and hepatitis treatments, so very worthwhile causes. Mm-hmm. But some of the business practices of pharmaceuticals and traditional medicine started to wear on me. And you didn't so, quite mesh well with that? Not completely. So I really saw the potential of cannabis as a medicine to complement and supplement and synergize with what we have in the traditional world. So mm. Um, just really saw an opportunity there in 2014 to take a leap of faith and, uh, as LeBron would say, take my talents to a different place. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. What was your uh, PhD dissertation on? Oh man, my wife loves me to say it cause it's very long. Um, it was in organic chemistry. Um, I studied the, how natural products, so compounds like THC or CBD, how they're made by plants. 
Oh, um, wow. But the title of my dissertation was uh, The Synthesis of Polyketide and Diterpene Natural Products. So I studied a few different type of plant-derived molecules and how we could make them and how nature makes them. Whoa. And then their applications. So could these be used as medicines or building blocks for medicines? So, um, Is that specifically cannabis? Are there are other plants that you researched? Oh, not cannabis at all. So okay. similar types of building blocks. So, you know, when you make organic molecules, be it THC, CBD, or, you know, an anti-malarial or some other, you know, drug, um, these are complex molecules that take a mm. lot of pieces to put together like a puzzle, right? Mm -hmm. And the molecules I worked on in grad school use some of the same pieces that are used to build cannabinoids or terpenes or flavonoids. So it's the biosynthesis that's you know, kind of common among a lot of these molecules, and they just take different pieces to end up with different end molecules. Hmm. Does that and make when, sense? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm <laughs> learning, right? I, I appreciate you breaking that down for me. So when you were doing that PhD, Paul, did you have a inclination that you were going to go into cannabis at all? Truthfully, no. Um, I, really, I really couldn't imagine at that time. Um, hmm. You know, when I was in grad school, my mom was actually battling cancer mm -hmm. and she was one of my inspirations to, you know, work in chemistry and develop new therapeutics and drugs to treat, you know, like I said, HIV or hepatitis or cancer obviously is near and dear to my heart. Mm -hmm. um, I did end up losing my mom to her battle to lymphoma and unfortunately there wasn't something there for her to mm -hmm. cure her. But um, as she was struggling through that, I... And she was in Wisconsin, you know, I, it was just sad that she didn't have access to cannabis. And that was just something that, you know, helped me on my journey and yeah. realized that more people need access to these. It's not for everyone. I always openly admit that, you know, I'm not one to claim that this is a miracle drug that's going to cure everything. But right. there's so much potential and so much left for us to study. Um, and I think most importantly, it's it's safe by and large, you know, yeah. Um over the millennia of consumption of cannabis, there's arguably no deaths from it. And that's because of how they work biologically. These don't affect the central nervous system or your, your breathing. So a reason why cannabinoids and cannabis therapeutics are quite safe and it's just about finding the right dose and the right combination because we know cannabis is complex. <laughs> yeah. And it's been... Uh... I'd say research has been suppressed, right? So we don't really know. Um, we haven't truly unlocked all the full the the full potential, more or Absolutely. less, as, as you know in your research. Yeah, I mean, for the first, you know, since the '70s through my childhood in the '80s, for a long time, all we tried to do is prove why it's bad, mm. and you know, we were trying to criminalize and demonize this plant instead mm -hmm. of find how it can help us it was the complete wrong way to do research and in those attempts to try to find something bad we found good things and if we went in with that lens of let's find the use for this instead of let's prove why this is going to harm you maybe we wouldn't be here in this state today where it's still so criminalized and yeah. people are in prison for this plant yeah so going into your company uh, chemistry great name uh, right when you entered the industry, you hit the ground running. You entered the Emerald Cup um, and had a, a finishing place. Could you tell me about that experience? Yeah, it was an exciting time. So that was right around when legalization was coming on board here in California. So that was okay. the Emerald Cup of late 2017. And so we set up um, in, in 2016 as a B2B manufacturer first uh, called mm. Parado Labs. And over the course of our first year plus, we worked with growers and helped them diversify their portfolios, you know, beyond flour, um, making vape carts or concentrates for them. And in that time, we really understood what we were doing that's unique. Um, yeah. And out of that came chemistry. And yeah, we purposefully did target the Emerald Cup as our kind of launch and, you know, announcement. For the B2C here, side. Of here we're on the scene. Exactly. Yeah. So we had pivoted at that point um, to focus on our brand chemistry. And a lot of the farmers that worked with us in our early days still supply us now. We, we built a great network in those years. And um, it's, yeah, what really makes us special is 
that supply chain. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's interesting that you, you started B2B, built up that supply chain, and then leveraged that to enter uh, to go to consumers with the chemistry brand. Um, do you think it would have worked the other way around if you went uh, kind of started out on the consumer side and then went B two B? Because I've seen I've seen companies go you know both directions. It could have. I think you're right. It could work either way. Um, for us, starting the other way definitely was an advantage. We were bootstrapped and okay. you know just trying to do something differently. That was really the principle we started on when we started Parado Labs was try to do something different in terms of processing specifically and extraction and refinement. Um, so I think, you know, in that time doing B2B, we still face challenges of like education of like what we do differently. You know, at that right. time people use CO2 and butane and that was about it. And for us to say like, we will not use gases and we do not use gases and we use nothing but liquid for extraction and refinement, you know, that took getting over the hump to convince people that that was, a method worth, you know, exploring and trying and trusting us in really. Mm -hmm. And from that work, you know, we got such response from those farmers that this tastes just like the strain I processed. And we heard that over and over again. And that's really what birthed chemistry is okay. all that feedback. People saying like, wow, this is different. And this is like my weed. And that's where we came up with stay true to the plant. And that's really our mission as chemistry is to highlight what these growers do and put their you know blood sweat and tears into for you know nine months a year and we don't want it to just be any old weed product we want it to be a special weed product from you know a single farm a single batch and to really highlight you know like i said what that plant is about whether it's the terpene profile or the cannabinoid profile we try to bring that to life in in our extracts whether it's a you know, a concentrate or a vaporizer or a tincture. Yeah, I'm sure there are so many different options uh, to enter the Emerald Cup with. How did you settle on the product that you did? Um, at that point, we were just most confident in our vaporizers. Um, we had really good hardware, which has continued to evolve at that time. Um, and yeah, our concentrates at that point, we're still trying to feel out its position in the market. So um, we entered our tangerine power and our dark side of the moon the competition as vaporizers mm. um, and indica and sativa and our tangerine power ended up placing third which was a an amazing and incredible surprise i mean honestly yeah. we we entered confidently we really felt good about our but our entries but as the new guy in the scene you never know how it will be received and i think mm -hmm. the full package is really what did it for us you know we we really put out a professional presentation right from the start from how our packages look to you know the information we put on them from all the cannabinoids and all the terpenes that we can detect you know we go above and beyond what's what's required and that's always been what we do from safety testing to even just that information for consumers you know sadly you still don't see terpenes on most products and we did that from day one because we want consumers to start to learn like what is affecting them you know if they're like wow mm -hmm. that strain made me feel weird what was it <laughs> you're explaining it, the what... science behind it yeah we want people to know it's like okay if it's terpinaline rich it might you know energize you and if it's mercine rich maybe it's going to chill you out so hmm. start to give people that information so they can learn about their own chemistry that's really what it's about this chemistry is more than just the science it's hmm. about the chemistry between us the chemistry between us and the plant so that's why one of the reasons we picked the name is it's it's more complex than that. Even though I'm a chemist and it's kind of like my word, I should probably have it tattooed <laughs> on me. <laughs> but it was really Trevor who who pitched it to me. He was like, it was yeah, not my idea. I was like, wow, of course that resonates with me. And it was a challenge, of course, to choose the name. So cool. once you placed uh, third place at the Emerald Cup, how did that impact your brand um, from that point on? Oh, it definitely was a great catalyst from the start. Um, you know, something we could sticker right on our package. <clears throat> Look, we've been recognized by, you know, arguably the best cannabis yeah. competition in the world. It's and a huge deal. So we're, we're very proud of that and definitely utilize that, that marketing power. And it really opened some conversations as we were entering the market. Because really we had, before the Emerald Cup, I think we were only on a couple shelves. And that really started to catalyze, you know, us breaking into more really high quality retail shops and but it still was always a competitive, it is a competitive market. There's no doubt. 
uh, an award doesn't guarantee anything. Um, it's what you do after that, like to make people know why it was special, right? Yeah. But it definitely it was a great, the, the great, great launching impression. pad for us. Yeah. Yeah. And then where you go from that, it's all all based upon your execution. So in in my research uh, for this interview, I came across this organization that you're part of um, that has to do with sustainability. So OSC Squared, can you tell me about that? Yeah. So this is a a longstanding organization that has been uh, formed around the natural product movement in <clears throat> in food and other consumer products. Oh, okay. Um, and recently, they've brought um, cannabis into the group, which is which is great. I think it's an important time to do that before the industry moves too far along and um, that we all have sustainability and protection of the earth as part of our practices and our principles in this industry. Um, and yeah, OSC Squared is led by some great um, consumer products that we all are aware of from Dr. Bronner's to Nutiva to definitely uh, new me teas. So a lot of great leaders there and we're just happy to be a part of it. And it's kind of at its infancy right now for cannabis. What's um, the mission behind that organization? Uh, there's a lot of missions. So um, in cannabis, I think they're starting at the cultivation side, really, um, in terms of certifying how people grow, you know, obviously trying to get organic certifications for cannabis or even next level. I mean, most of the farms we work with already practice organic practices and regenerative cultivation practices as well. So they're amazing stewards of the land. Um, but yeah, OSC squared is trying to bring, you know, that conscious, you know, product making to this market and it starts with farming and, you know, what we're bringing to that is the, the next step in the supply chain that, you know, you can't just think about how it's cultivated. It has to also, you know, half the products are manufactured now. So what we do and how we manufacture the waste we make, the, uh, packaging of our products, all of this, you know, and then finally retailers too so we're trying to get this to be the full full circle from the mm. farm to the customer and we're working on this campaign for november where it is going to be that from farms to manufacturers to retailers collaborating to bring awareness to this campaign and to sustainability in this industry because you know the reason that indoor growing really came about is because we were pushed inside not that we needed to be i mean the advances of indoor cultivation are amazing but there's no doubt that outdoor cultivation is way more sustainable and just better for our environment. So uh, I give much, much love to our indoor growers, but, um, you know, I do wish that we could grow everything outside, like almost every other agricultural product out there. Yeah. So you spent uh, several years in drug research after your PhD and um, then you started the B2B side and, and started the B2C side. Can you walk me through kind of that, that shift that you talked about in the traditional medicine world that kind of just made you reach a tipping point and motivated you to enter the cannabis world? What, what did that look like? Yeah, like I said before, it was kind of a, a many-year process and evolution and mm -hmm. where I was at, of course. Um, yeah, like I said, my mom really motivated me to go the, the traditional route as, you know, I saw her and see so many others struggle through cancer treatments and um, that that was where I really wanted to focus at first and learn mm -hmm. really how drugs were made and and just spend more time in the lab really and, and just gain a lot of as much experience as I could. That was like my main yeah. goal with Gilead at first. And, you know, through... The projects I worked on in HIV and hepatitis and immunology, you know, a lot of those things are done with multiple drugs or multiple molecules to treat them. And um, because you can't take one drug to suppress HIV or hep C, so you're having to put multiple things together to make an effect effective treatment. And I think cannabis is somewhat similar to that, where you have this polypharmacy in the plant. So you know, oftentimes in medicine, we try to just take one thing and use that until it doesn't work. Think of like antibiotics, like yeah. keep giving an antibiotic and then you develop Makes resistance sense. and have to give another something else. And if we had a more well-rounded approach, I think maybe we wouldn't experience those problems. And so as I watched, you know, like I said, those virus worlds 
HIV and hepatitis and how we had to treat them with many things, it just led me to dig deeper into cannabis and see all these molecules that are in here. It's not just CBD, not just THC. And that, you know, we shouldn't be ripping those things apart too. You know, I don't want to go the route of pharmaceuticalization of cannabis. I mean, there's a place for that, you know, in places that don't have access like we do in California. You know, people in, you know, Wisconsin, for example, like can't get THC, but some people need CBD still. Even yep. if it is CBD alone, it can it can certainly help with certain things. But uh, the studies are pretty clear that the polypharmacy is more effective. You know, when you have a, a full spectrum extract or a full plant extract versus an isolated cannabinoid, most studies are showing that those complex polypharmacy of the full spectrum products are more beneficial than the standalone CBD or THC. Break that down for me. Polypharmacy, so many different cannabinoids working together in an entourage effect exactly you nailed it so polypharmacy bringing it to the cannabis world would be the entourage effect so Mm. that's kind of uh the term coined by dr ethan russo who i think really popularized that's that thinking in cannabis and yeah it really comes from i think relating to that polypharmacy of whether it's antivirals or you know western or eastern medicine where you are taking more plant derived or natural things to mm-hmm. you know put together to heal your ailments whatever they might be right where is the current state of <laughs> cannabis medicine today you know how how much research do we have left to do to fully understand the plant as a form of medicine uh we still have a long way to go of course um you know i think there's some misconception about what's been done. Uh, I think the reality is not enough has been done here stateside and in the U S there are leaders all over the world that have the ability to do this research, like in Israel or throughout Europe. I immediately thought of Israel. Yeah. Yeah, Israel and throughout Europe and, um, and maps is leading studies even in cannabis as well. So, um, maps does a lot of work in psychedelic therapeutics and Mm. have also included cannabis in that. And, you know, here domestically still, a lot of the studies are based on smoking cannabis and smoking crappy cannabis from Mississippi. So <laughs> I think the main I thing... I think we read the same research. <laughs> yeah, so the main thing that we need here in the U.S. is regulatory change to allow easier study of what is available in the market now. Yeah, you, know, you will not find anything in a dispensary that's like that crap from Mississippi. <laughs> you know, um, I wish that our products could be studied. That's... A goal of mine you know we have libraries of oils now and characterize them as best we can and you know it's my dream that we can provide these for study in the future um, but... libraries of oil that sounds amazing what walk me through the steps of uh, going through that process to get those oils researched what would have to happen in your opinion Paul yeah I think the first step would be changing some regulations <laughs> so we can provide medicines um, you know I think Correct Is that at the federal wrong. level, state level? I think it would need all over. For example, there is a research organization or consortium, whatever word you'd like to use, that mm-hmm. was started here in California back, you know, as the medical system was evolving, I think. I don't think the organization started until the early 2000s, um, where they were pulling some of the universities together to try to study more of, you know, medical cannabis at, before we got to the full adult legalization. And I think I heard that, you know, only a couple of years ago, the state was thinking of importing from Canada to do those studies because it's federally really? legal in Canada, where that just broke my heart, where it's like, why are us California producers not providing medicine for studies mm-hmm. here? And why it's because can't we of, do it in our it's backyard? It's because of those barriers. And I think those need to be broken down first. There's been some movement, but I think the, you know, the red tape to get through that is just so difficult for you know Mm -hmm. small companies like us you know there's not many companies in cannabis that are like a pharmaceutical company that have the budgets to do endless research massive r&d budgets yeah I'd, i'd i'd love to and i dream to but you know the best we do at this point is you know get the as most as much analytical data as we can to know what we have but you know one of the challenges we face in this world still is there's a lot of unidentified, you know, in our products, 
Yeah. Our testing results show, you know, 80 to 90 percent identified between cannabinoids and terpenes, but there's still something we don't know, you know, and so we have work to do on the analytical side to like identify all those minor things that are in there. And you think that minutia could be the key to unlock a lot of research? It certainly could be. That's why, you know, in my opinion, if you're someone that's trying to put together a strain by putting together individual components, whether it's cannabinoids or terpenes, like you can get close, but you're never going to quite get there because of those minor things or even just that subtle change in percentage. You know, you look at most cannabis, you see the same six to 10 terpenes in them. They're just in different concentrations and they can taste so different, even if they're in the same hierarchy. And it's likely because of those things we don't know yet, whether it's the flavonoids, which we're working on with some California labs to uh, identify and study those more. But just mm-hmm. like I said, with terpenes, like um, not much of the market is testing with terpene, testing terpenes yet. So the desire to test flavonoids is another <laughs> step further where I think people aren't quite there yet. Um, but yeah, it's those, those, those little things that I think make the difference. And, you know, Mm -hmm. you never know, honestly, what could be the molecule that, you know, heals your ailment. Um, there are potent molecules in, in nature that you need such a small amount to have an effect. I mean, think LSD. (laughs) Yeah. Not a natural I was thinking of the spirit molecule when you said that. Yeah. Think of some of those, like you need tiny, tiny doses to have an effect. Um, Mm -hmm. and that could be possible in cannabis. We can't say that yet. You know, if there's something that's below a percentage in there, that's really the magic that brings an effect. So, um, yeah, it could be those little little things. (laughs) Yeah. I appreciate you breaking it down. So we're going to take our first break, Paul. And when we get back, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into the organic chemistry that you bring to the industry and your company, Chemistry. Hope you're enjoying this interview with Paul. I want to give a brief moment to talk about the extraction R&D dangers and breakthroughs that lead to novel risks. According to Hub Insurance, cannabis extractors will experiment with new ways to apply existing methods with ethanol and CO2, as well as innovative methods adopted from the agriculture industry using water and light exposure and different nutrients for extraction. You might know that already. However, they go on to say extraction R&D will be a major focus for cannabis companies in 2021. Operations continue to search for a competitive advantage to increase that yield and develop a superior product. This becomes a potential liability with cannabis extractors that are modifying the use of existing equipment for a different type of extraction. Flammable products are often used and explosions are common. This is pulled directly from the Hub Insurance 2021 Market Outlook for the Cannabis Industry. If you like what you're listening to, go ahead and check them out at hubinternational.com. I'll make sure to link them in the description below. Now back to the episode. All right, we are back from the break, and I know that your background's in organic chemistry. Can you teach me how you apply organic chemistry to uh, your day-to-day at the chemistry company and brand? Oh, sure. I mean... Organic chemistry is all around us, so at any moment I could be thinking about it. Um, but yeah, I mean, for our day to day, I mean, it it starts with processing, of course. I mean, there's mm-hmm. so much organic chemistry and chemistry involved in how we process. And I'd say the key principles in terms of what we do and just extraction in general, I'd say, are about um, solubility is a huge thing. So how are the molecules you're trying to extract from plant soluble in the solvent you're using, whether that's water, CO2, butane, solvents we use, the liquids we use, you know, how do they go in there and under the conditions right. that you're extracting too, like some extraction methods are super cold. So that can change solubility profiles and what you can pull out of that plant. So you can potentially change selectivity with temperature, but yeah, you have, you know, polar compounds. So things that are soluble in water, like ethanol, so that's used for extraction or nonpolar things like um, butane. Um, mm. So, you know, very greasy. And, you know, if it when it is a liquid, it separates from water. So you kind of have those two ends of the spectrum in terms of extraction solvents. Okay. And, you know, in their kind of 
solubility profiles. And what we use is something that's in the middle. And I think that's something unique um, to us is like we've developed a method that uses a solvent that is not as polar or water soluble as ethanol and not as greasy as the anes like propane, butane. And then CO2, you know, it depends on the conditions. You can really play around with CO2 and where it fits in that spectrum um, of polarity and solubility based because you can play with so many conditions when doing CO2 extraction. But a lot of people compare it to ethanol. It's like pretty comparable to ethanol extraction in terms of what you pull out. So that's and, one of the main principles of organic chemistry yeah. that matters. Um, let's see. Then... Uh, another important um, principle for us is vapor pressure and um, boiling points and distillation. So how you separate these extraction solvents from the oils that you've extracted and that you want. So mm -hmm. things like CO2 and butane are gases under natural conditions. So those are removed easier. But when you talk about liquids that you're trying to remove, there's differences in you know, boiling points and vapor pressures that can affect how easily you can recover those and reuse those and the temperatures and conditions that you need also to remove those. So a key factor of our method is how gentle it is. And it's really important for us because we find it very important to be able to maintain the acids found in uh, cannabis. So that would be THCA or CBDA um, mm. most famously. So those are the cannabinoids that are called the raw ones. So if you cut a fresh bud, like I actually did from my plant this morning, you'll find <laughs> mostly those acidic forms. So then you need to dry cure, roll it up and smoke it <laughs> to turn it into <laughs> THC or CBD. Or in our case, we control that process and can actually decide, you know, what ratio of THC to THCA we want or CBD to CBDA based on how long we heat it and under what conditions. So, um, is that a proprietary process to you and chemistry? Uh, that control of like those acidic and neutral compounds? I'd say throughout the process. So do you have proprietary you know, methodologies that are unique to your company? Uh, I would say for us, what makes us unique is the full package. So, um, you know, extraction is one step. So how mm -hmm. you remove the oils from the product, from the plant and then Refinement is pretty typical. So what you do after that primary extraction, you know, you can get usable oils just from that primary extraction for a lot of purposes. But for, for example, for a vape cartridge, you usually have to do some post-processing. You want to remove mm -hmm. any waxes or lipids, um, you know, maybe depending on your color preference. We like colorful extracts from yellows to reds. We're not trying to remove that because we believe that's the flavonoids and when we've actually distilled our oils, you can see that color go to the waste. And that's why you get clear, you know, oils from distillates. Mm. It's our theory that you're removing flavonoids. And again, that's something we're working on proving. Mm -hmm. But yeah, what's proprietary to us is really all of that together. The extraction plus how we refine. And then the finishing part, that decarboxylation or not, is pretty ubiquitous. I think that's pretty well known in the industry that you need to heat right. to decarb and you need to be careful with heat if you want to maintain THCA and make diamonds or, you know, concentrates that all the different many consumers like. Yeah. But yeah, right I think on. it's that, that whole picture that makes chemistry special and that is our proprietary method. So, for example, like we've not for chemistry products, but, you know, when we've done B2B work, we've bought BHO or um, CO2 extract and refined mm -hmm. it via our method and you can get comparable full spectrum extracts they might be a little different depending on you know the conditions of extraction used but you know i think um that's an important thing to know is like you know you can kind of create similar products from a you know exhaustive extraction if you refine it the same way like our method mm -hmm. or distillation so you could take our extraction and distill it and get crystal clear oil or you can take bho and do that as well or you can get, you know, nice, colorful, full spectrum oils or live resins, like which are popular now, which bear more color like our products. In my research, I actually came across a couple patents that you have uh, written. Are those directly related to chemistry or are those kind of uh, broader? Um, so most of my publications and patents are from my earlier world, from either grad school mm. or from Gilead. 
Okay. Um, I did, there's one that I'm an author on that is in the cannabis world in a company that I worked with prior to starting Peridot and Chemistry. Mm-hmm. Um, and you'll find related things in there, but it's not going to be the chemistry type of method gotcha. in, in that patent. So as of right now, uh, no patents, uh, like you don't have any patents underway for the chemistry brand. Um, at this point, we've we've done a lot of research to see what we should do in, in terms of protection of IP mm-hmm. and, and strategy. At this point, um, it's trade secret for us. That's the way we've decided to keep nice. our methods in-house. Um, you know, we obviously document our processes very well with SOPs and Mm -hmm. Um, but at, at the juncture of making that decision of going public, we decided to wait, um, because one, we just wanted to develop more data and, and really have a full story to tell when we do tell how we do things. And honestly, we, we've even debated whether the patent round is the right way to go. Um, Mm. like I said, from the start, I like to do different things differently and sometimes even think of crazy things like. (laughs) <laughs> open, open sourcing um Ooh, you know i, think I like what, that i think the way we do things i'm just so proud of what we've developed that i want to get some of the information just out for you know educational and democrat you know, democratizing uh knowledge yeah i mean patents help do that just in a different way like if we didn't have the patent system everyone would be starting at square one you know in the drug world mm-hmm. especially like if no one knows anything about what anyone else is doing, we're all starting further back. So, you know, we can debate the good and bad of the patent system. You know, there's obviously problems with it in terms of drug pricing and and that Gouging. Ki- kind of world. But the innovation that it can help spark is really important. Um, but for us, yeah, to patent it has been a difficult decision to make of whether we want to like stake our flag mm-hmm. and say no one can do it and in the end protection of that is the challenge right uh mm-hmm. if you do your job really well <clears throat> you'll never know how you processed it so that's one of the realities we face too is like if we go ahead and publish how we do everything and someone does it right and well it'll be hard for us to tell <laughs> because you've removed all those processing solvents and um, like i said there are many ways to make products that can look mm-hmm. and be quite comparable in terms of profile and a lot of time it's the strain doing the talking and not mm-hmm. even the, not even the method mm-hmm. i'm curious uh about your day-to-day paul so uh, maybe walk me through pre-covid and and the current times that we live in today what's a typical day look like for you oh man um are you like hands on in the lab like every day are you more like working on the company than in the company what does that look like it certainly evolved over the years. I mean, um, we, we started in 2016 and I was in the lab all the time. Um, it was really just, so Trevor Mazza was my co-founder and he was doing mm-hmm. all this organizational stuff in the office and, um, you know, keeping us running and, you know, working with our clients when we were Peridot. And, and then as chemistry was being born, he really led that charge. Like he is, nice. he's a marketing expert and, uh, you know, a great eye and editor and, and really helped bring chemistry to life. Um, but yeah, from the start, I was in the lab with one other chemist and we were developing our methods, bringing in our equipment, making product. And But then over time, we were fortunate to hire more chemists. And um, mm-hmm. so I didn't have to be in there all the time. And yet now though, I'm on the other side where I, I really miss it. Um, mm-hmm. I don't get there in there nearly as often as I'd like to. Um, but now in this time i've been back in there more than i was probably in 2019 we're a little bit smaller than we used to be the industry's been a little bumpy and we've had to course correct like many um yeah we've had to consolidate our team a little bit but i'm still really proud of the team we have and uh the passion and dedication that everyone brings definitely Um, but yeah as we've gotten a little bit smaller i've had to lend my hands in there and but it also like helps balance me um Mm -hmm. when i just sit and think about finance or <laughs> you know long, long-term plans <laughs> like it's that fine balance like there's times when you're so head down and like you're only thinking about today and tomorrow and mm-hmm. or when you're like oh i actually have time to think about next week or next month or next year so i think COVID actually helped bring a little balance back for me um 
it threw us all, it threw us all off for sure but i'm trying to take advantage of the opportunities here mm-hmm. the good opportunities i get to spend more time with my family and mm-hmm. you know and just realize that work doesn't have to be the way you know it doesn't have to be everything it doesn't have to be everything nor does it have to always be in one place right like we have an mm. office but people don't always need to be here of course to make the products you can't do that from home but you know our team that works in the office can be more flexible and i just think that's good for everyone right now especially. i agree and i mean taking a little bit meta about this interview right now in time look at the power of technology you know i'm, I'm not out in san francisco or you know wherever you're located you're not out in Tucson where I'm at, but we're still able to connect and educate the world on processing yourself and the chemistry brand. Um, you know, typically in the Canna Cribs model, we fly to a you know a state, we go film a, a grow operation or several grow operations. Um, this is the first time that we've ever done anything, uh, you know, electronically. So it's pretty cool. Well, we're happy to be part of the maiden voyage, but we certainly wish we could have you here. But um, we'll be there soon. I, but, yeah, I promise no, I think you that. It's, in, it's important that we all adjust to this and and try not to just go back to our old ways. I think we have opportunities, mm-hmm. like I said, to you know, especially thinking about you know the hippie and sustainability mission in mm-hmm. me about can we use this opportunity to make steps towards fighting climate change? You know, do we all need to? fly everywhere for sales meetings or you know Mm. face to face of course it's great we all need human contact but like we're doing right now this this works too and um yeah we can still make connections and have great conversations and you know problem solve from from afar yeah it's a great time period of reflection on how we can do things better uh what's most important to us you know what did we take for granted Um, And I agree with you, you know, moving forward, um, we'll never go back to exactly we were for many reasons. But of course, one, we realize how to do things better, you know, how to live our lives more um, in a more fulfilling way or run our companies more efficiently. You know, uh, it's 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 an incredible opportunity um, to look at it optimistically, for sure. You shouldn't be doing this alone, like collaboration is the name of the game here and at least That's for right. us we really feel strongly about that and i think there's a lot in the industry and in california that feel that way too is like we need to support each other and lift each other up and you know Rising not times. not everyone has to do everything themselves and you know i think we all struggle with that from time to time just be like i'll do it like we got this like i don't need your help or i don't vertical par- integration is not always the best path forward yeah, and not, kind of collaborating in the supply chain can be successful. I mean, California set that system up, I think, purposefully. And, you know, unfortunately, now it's proving that, like, you need some level of vertical integration to six steps in the supply chain instead of two or three, like the old days of, like, all right, grower to somebody to shop mm-hmm. or grower to shop. <laughs> There's not a <laughs> lot of hands needing, you know, pieces of that pie and it's why we still do compete with the, you know, the traditional market too, is that, you know, there's not the regulation or taxes there to stop that market. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think that's why vertical integration is like attractive for a lot of people. You know, you don't have to worry about the margin on every piece of the chain, but mm. for us, we like to focus on, I think we learned our lessons of trying to do a little bit too much ourselves. And pulling back How on so? that recently, you know, trying to distribute, trying to, um, you know, do, like I said, try to do too much yourself when, you know, you know, you can lean on partners that do you rely have on the a expertise. distributor in particular. We do now. So through the early days, it was useful to have a distribution license and it's actually uh, part of our equity partnership here in Oakland. Um, so we started mm-hmm. our distribution company with um, a gentleman from Oakland that had previously been arrested for cannabis Mm. and he's a genetics expert and is starting a nursery and part of just the regulations we we needed to create something together and we created a distribution company that could be useful for both of us in the future and he's just getting his nursery online and we're building this partnership where we hope to take his genetics and take them to the farms that we work with and really have this full circle with oh wow even within oakland it's part of our dream is to like really have full circle Oakland project 
um, that really is about, you know, inclusion and diversity and equity, really. That's pretty incredible. Uh, walk me through what it's like to collaborate and partner with your company. You know, is there like a online application? Like, how does it initially kick off? Can anyone just reach out to you? You know, what does that look like? Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, not quite the online application, but we occasionally just get random shout outs on our info at mm. trichemistry.com. People saying, you know, we'd love to work with you, whether it's simple white labeling for them or, you know, becoming a source for us that's happened too. like farms just reach out and they've become part of our network just by hearing about us and hearing good words from other farmers um you know our, our most important collaborator right now like you're asking before is our distributor we're now distributed by kiva uh which we're mm. very proud to be um, part of their portfolio and they've really helped us focus on like i said what we're is good at kiva the chocolate company yeah it's so kiva has a sales and service side now that they have about a dozen Interesting. I a dozen or so maybe 15 brands now that they um take to retail so we're able to collaborate with their sales team and their logistics team to not only open new accounts for us but also then just do that delivery for us so we don't have to worry about that part so for distribution right now we just do the we go pick up weed we can handle <laughs> we can handle that part and then we utilize it for the testing part we like our products to be fully retail ready when they leave us so because of this you know order of operations that things need to be yeah. you know, brought in manufactured <clears throat> transferred to a distributor and tested for safety and everything before it goes to consumer we're able to do that with our distribution license in-house and it, like i said make sure everything's totally good to go before it goes to kiva and then mm -hmm. they just handle that getting it to retail for us and again that's something that's allowed us to focus on what we do which is manufacture and sell and market you know we're we try to do that but we don't need a fleet of vehicles we don't need a fleet of drivers they've got it and you know that's a way we can all be more efficient too i mean we've talked about it with many people in this industry it's like there are trucks driving up and down the state empty the you know the return route like we shouldn't be doing that normal you know shipping companies don't leave empty trucks <laughs> if at all possible so i think you know, that's another reason that we want to partner is just for that efficiency. Yeah. Makes a whole lot of sense. It goes back to sustainability as well. You know, if you have one leg of the trip that has no product in it and they're still using the same gas, they're still, you know, using the same, you know, critical road infrastructure. I mean, all of that, you could be maximizing it double. Um, so that's pretty smart. Yep. Uh, I'm sure you guys get a lot of growers, you know, reaching out to you via Instagram or your website, you know, looking to partner with you. What do you look for in a grower? I mean, we have quite uh, a long list of metrics that we look for. Um, so give a shout out to Jimmy Levi, our director of flower and now VP of business operations actually, but he, he really liked the director of flower weed man title. But uh, Jim, Jimmy used to work uh, on many farms and particularly Moon Maid farms. And he, oh, okay. I've heard of Moon Maid. Yeah, so he's had his hands in the dirt and um, knows a lot of the community and um, goes to, we all go to our farms, but Jimmy, more than any of us, go to the farm and visit and see their practices. So that's like first and foremost is like, what are their cultivation practices? You know, we want to make sure, you know, like I said, they're stewards of the land, that they're not using pesticides, that we really prefer everyone growing in the ground rather than pots. Um, mm. So like there's all these things like, you know, you don't have to check every box um, to be one of our suppliers, but like, you know, we try to have as many checked as possible. You know, like I said, like working towards organic or already there, regenerative is even better. Um, so those those are first and foremost, like the cultivation practices and, and then just the relationship too is important, you know, yeah. um, how we, communicate and expectations and then of course there's genetics genetics are super important um you know you can be the greatest grower and have the greatest practices but if you're working with shitty genetics you're yeah. not gonna end up with very good product <laughs> so i would almost knows. argue like that that's probably one of the most important oh, yeah. um, aspects because that's passed all the way through the consumer you know when they go to the dispensary they're looking sometime you know the savvy consumer will look specifically for those genetics. Oh, absolutely. We've learned that lesson, you know, in our products over the years. If we have had a few unique strains without the, you know, uh, fame or, you know, 
name recognition of others. You know, yeah. even two things with very similar profiles and similar tastes. You know, if one has Kush in its name and the other doesn't, the Kush sells better. So, like, that name recognition is important. So, like, working with the right gene genetics is super important from, you know, that retail side, but also even the cultivation side, right? Like, um, how does it yield? How does it stand up to mm -hmm. pests and climate? And how resilient is it? So, um, that's obviously super important for them, too. Like, how much work do they have to put into it? And, you know, how long does it flower? So, it probably, like you said, it's probably the most important, like, in the full picture. Um, but yeah, those cultivation practices are also first and foremost for us. And that's why, you know, the OSC squared is also related to sun and earth. So sun and earth certification is a certification for mostly growers at this point to show that they use, you know, organic and or regenerative practices and, um, you know, and beyond just cultivation about how you treat your employees and how you deal with, you know, your business practices and your ways. Wow. So everything like that. That's and, pretty comprehensive. Yeah. And we're working also to become a sun and earth certified manufacturer. Like I said, like we have to think about the whole supply chain in terms of mm -hmm. its impact and, and especially from the earth impact. Um, so we are working to get certified as a sun and earth manufacturer. So again, like when we're working with others or, making chemistry products that people have confidence that like we take these steps and that we care. Mm -hmm. Incredible. Well, we're going to take another break here, Paul. And when we get back, uh, we're going to dive into uh, the concentrates that you sell and what makes them so special. Hey, hope you're enjoying this episode with Paul so far. If you are a mad scientist and you are doing a lot of R and D in the extraction space, I want to highly encourage you to reach out to Hub Insurance and make sure that everything that you're doing in your lab is covered with your existing policies. You know, sometimes that competitive edge that comes with tweaking a piece of equipment here and there can result in pretty big risks, sometimes explosions. And you don't want to be on the wrong side of history with that. So. I highly encourage you to reach out to our good friend Jim Clements. I'm going to link his email and phone number in the description below. So you guys are covered and you are leading the industry in your new extraction technology without putting yourself, your building, your team at risk. Now back to the episode. All right, we are back from the break and I would love to hear from you uh, maybe at a high level and then we can get into the nitty gritty what makes chemistry concentrates so much better than the rest of the market? You know, what really sets you apart? The simplest answer would be full spectrum. Um, mm. That's been the kind of characterization of our products that's been most important from the start and mm -hmm. something that we've really leaned into. And really, again, it came to the color. Um, you know, when we talk about chemistry and the way we present it is the, the spectrum logo we have is about that color. Um, and that, you know, we want to live life in color and that ties into our extracts really that again, we're not trying to make clear distillate and just THC, um, that we want to, again, highlight the strain as best we can in extract form. And, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, for us that full spectrum means full spectrum of the cannabinoids that the plant makes of terpenes of flavonoids and, and, you know, maybe things were yet to, um, identify even but you know as we when we started um with that language i think the hemp world has actually helped us you know in that education of consumers of what that really means so i think when we were educating on full spectrum you know in late 2017 it wasn't quite as clear what what that meant really but the hemp world has really helped clarify because now there's full spectrum broad spectrum and you know then just isolates in the hemp world and people start to understand, all right, broad spectrum means like more cannabinoids from hemp than just CBD, but minus THC, and then full spectrum hemp, right, has that little bit of THC. So that's definitely helped us in terms of our messaging and, you know, even seen a, a CVS billboard, I think along I-80 that said full spectrum CBD products at CVS or something. And and I was actually excited to see that. I was like, that's, that's mm -hmm. good for us because I think that 
anyone that can help in our education and they do overlap nicely like um because we think of it the same way it's like if you have a full spectrum cannabis extract it's about more than just those individual cannabinoids and um and then to us it's about not ripping out everything else too like those flavonoids yeah i'd like to unpack that billboard you drove by for a moment so digging a little bit deeper cvs nationwide company i'm not sure if they're around the world or not um huge marketing budget right they have the money to you know place advertisements on billboards and now that the hemp uh you know with the u.s farm bill now that hemp is uh you know interstate commerce and people can walk into a cvs and buy it i agree with you i think those companies uh big box chain stores um putting their money behind um, CBD products, it's a rising tide for all of us. And I, I'm excited, you know, as a, as a marketer in the cannabis world, I'm excited to look at what that looks like, you know, five, 10 years down the, down the line when um, there is a federal legalization and now cannabis is being sold um, everywhere and, and what that means when we're educating consumers it's it's pretty exciting to see that billboard um and, and hear that experience from you yeah it is i mean it's you know a glimpse into what we might see in the future like you're saying is mm-hmm. you know they've opened their door to the to hemp products and you know accepting them in and that hopefully that's door stays open for us when there's regulatory change for for cannabis and thc containing products Cause we, yeah. you know, we always say, I mean, even in the hemp world, like that those full spectrum products are going to be better than your CBD alone products. Again, like we talked about before, um, that those, that synergy, that entourage effect is, mm-hmm. is important even in low concentrations in hemp that, you know, THC is found in. Um, but yeah, I, I can't wait for those days when, you know, you see our products sitting there on the cvs or walgreens shelf particularly our moods line i think that would look great on a on a shelf right next to Mm -hmm. you know hemp derived products yeah definitely so as you are you know walking through different dispensaries and looking at advertising online um and as a vape connoisseur yourself you know what are you seeing other vape companies get wrong you know what's most most common um that you see Ooh, that's a that's a tough one, and I don't like to talk shit. <laughs> and you definitely definitely don't have to name anyone. But oh no. Maybe um maybe some principles that you see um, yeah. that you think uh, could be strengthened across the board. I think one of our bigger issues is just language. Um, like I said, even that challenge of full spectrum, broad spectrum, mm-hmm. isolate. You know, just the education around what that means is a challenge and becoming clearer but you know i think in this world now of live resin and uh diamonds or all these you know kind of catchy names for products that like are can maybe be a little bit trendy and people follow those trends but then don't necessarily stand true to what that really means you know for example if you look at a live resin cartridge on the market right there's a variety of them and a lot of people make them and label them as such but what is that live resin cart in reality and like sometimes you have to dig deeper whether it's on the back of the box or <clears throat> on that company's website or maybe you don't find it anywhere but like is it just live terpenes on top of distillate is it you know live resin mixed with distillate is it you know just live resin oil so I think that's one of our bigger challenges and what causes confusion and and some people also you know i can't deny there's there's dishonest manufacturers out there that may label something false advertising yeah label something that is something that it's not and just following kind of a trend instead of it being truly that but in the end you know again i think i'm not one to argue about semantics and you know I think if more of that information was on the back, like that we provide in terms of testing Mm -hmm. results, I think you could then go head to head and really start to see like, what is this made with? What, you know, what is this product truly? But 
there's a lot of good makers out there doing good things and and I think continuing to evolve, you know, even a year ago it was just about that high potency distillate, super clear, you know, with some terps on top, whether it's cannabis derived or not. Um, we always do nothing but cannabis. Our our vapes are 100% cannabis derived, the oil, the terpenes, everything. So I think, yeah, that was kind of a trend of last year when, you know, it was that potency chasing that really still happened. Yeah. But then the vape crisis really, I think, shook things up where, you know, people realized that you know, the potency thing is still there, but like terpenes now, like I think people are more cautious about where they source from if you're not using cannabis derived terpenes, you know, you can, like I said before, have, you know, the top five or 10 that we all see and put them in there from, you know, isolated from other fruits or plants out there and mm -hmm. compound them together to try to make it. But, you know, again, like, are you testing those as well as we test our cannabis, like the ingredients that you put in. Um, and that's, and then also the cutting agents was obviously the big problem of the yeah. crisis. So when people couldn't find oils that functioned in their devices, um, if it's that, that's the more uh, acceptable potentially reason, but the just diluting to raise profit margins is the most is that like the vitamin Terrible. E that you're referencing? Yeah, the vitamin E acetate like um, culprit of the vape crisis of September, October of last year, mm -hmm. um, where, you know, makers were just trying to find that additive that had the look and feel and viscosity and vapability of cannabis oil, but where you could dilute it. And it's the typical, you know, way to increase profit margins and particularly in the wrong side of the market. <laughs> yeah. That's the dark side of it. And then, yeah, when you put people's health at risk by doing that, like it was, I am imagine not done maliciously. Um, when you think about vitamin E and vitamin E acetate, like initially people are like, it's a vitamin that's probably good for you. And that, you that's and, how I read it. And you sure. see it in other products, right? Like it's you, you know, they're used in food products, like they're safe to consume orally. Um, but when we're combusting it. Combusting or vaporizing or just taking into your lungs. You know, these are the, the things that you have to think about when making products is like, how are these going to be consumed? And what is your safety data mm -hmm. to support it for that consumption method? Um, you know, if we have data that like, oh, it's safe to you know, consume a certain terpene at a certain concentration. A lot of that data is about oral and not about mm. combusted or vaporized. So um, I think that's an important factor that obviously we all need to consider and that the lesson that some people had to learn the hard way and sadly a lot of people were affected and, and died because of that. Mm. How did that impact what you were working on at Chemistry? Uh, it didn't impact our products at all because we never ever disrespect the plant like that and would never cut with anything um from the consumer demand were they kind of categorizing the chemistry vape cartridges in that bucket uh i th it it affected all of us no matter what um you know whether where you you were 100 percent cannabis drive brand or not um it just scared everyone rightfully so away from vapes for a period of time until mm. and you know we even saw bans in certain states it didn't happen here in california um where they were temporarily you know taken off the market um, i believe it happened in washington um but yeah it affected people's trust in us um mm. despite it likely not being from the regulated market you know after that crisis happened we worked with our labs very quickly to just provide that obvious negative data that we had that we do not add this to our products. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the labs worked tirelessly and very quickly to, you know, bring the confidence to the market. And so we worked with Anresco on that and they did us a, a great study and they published the results of like things they found on the black market versus the regulated market or traditional market and showed the astronomical amounts of vitamin E acetate and a lot of, the wrong side and none on ours you know we have to test endlessly for these and if you did that dilution too you would have an unsellable product you know if you cut your oil down to even 50 percent thc people don't want that <laughs> that's not 
what consumers are looking for, um, considering potency is still so important. So, but yeah, it really rocked the confidence, I think, in the general cannabis market as a whole. Mm-hmm. Um, I and think, are we back? Are we back at that level of, uh, you know, comfortability or uh, safety, would you say? I think we're getting there for sure. I mean, the data shows that things are bouncing back. Of course, I think COVID has had some effects too. This is a respiratory illness and um, mm. we're seeing, despite the rise in pre-rolls and um, you know other inhalable products, there's still more growth, I believe, in edibles and you know orally consumed products because people are smart and they know that like we should be pretty careful right now about what's going in your lungs. And I under yeah. I totally understand that, but I think people have re we've regained people's trust in terms of safety again. You know that was a huge incident and it you know kind of faded away um, as that likely tainted batch found its way out of the market and those good and bad producers learned that don't use that anymore. (laughs) So, um, I think we're, we're recovering. And, and like I said previously, like the whole, I think California industry particularly has adjusted as expectations on like where, where we're at and what the future holds and that, you know, slow and steady is an okay way to go. Yeah. Do you sell products outside of vape cartridges today? We do. Um, so historically, we've had vapes, um, tinctures, and concentrates. Um, at okay. the moment, we don't have our concentrates on the market. We're reimagining a few things about that, from how we package it to, um, nice. you know, thing, the, the strains and stuff we're presenting. So we're going to bring those back really soon. Um, but right now, we're focused mostly on yeah cartridges and tinctures, and we have our single origin lines in both tincture and cartridge. And we most recently launched our, our Moods by Chemistry tincture line. And this really addressed the standardization um, issue that we heard from some of our patients and customers where, you know, we had a batch of ACD. We've had ACDC, for example, on our menu of strain specific single origin tinctures from day one. Um, but they haven't been the same. You know, uh, we've had several harvests and every batch is a little bit different. And even, you know, how we process sometimes there's little nuances mm-hmm. in how it's processed. So, you know, that batch from 2018 isn't the same as it is in here in 2020. And um, yeah. some patients get a little bit scared by that. They're like, oh, my last one said it had, you know, it was two to one CBD to CBDA and this one's three to one. Am I going to be okay? And, you know, we have to have that conversation. Is that on the tincture side? Or... Yep, that's on the tincture side. Yeah. So sometimes we have to have that conversation. Like, you're going to be okay. Like, change in medicine can actually be good for you. But, you know, we don't always want to have to push people in that direction or have those complicated conversations sometimes, especially when we can't be in shops like we used to. Mm -hmm. So the moods line really has addressed that. It complements, I think our single origin line for those consumers that really know this strain is really what I need. But now moods is like compounded. It's a couple strains put together to make a consistent formulation. So we have six different SKUs ranging from 18 to one CBD to THC to one to 10. So, and then also standardized ratios of CBDA and THCA. That's really, again, what's important to us and what we think makes full spectrum special and oftentimes more efficacious. You know, again, you can see in tinctures even, and most on the market, it's just that CBD to THC ratio that's advertised and even what's in there. It might be just those two isolates put together or just two decarbed oils put together. But again, we're very cautious about how we handle it to maintain THCA and CBDA, because even though we don't know exactly, you know, what their power is, um, the anecdotal evidence is strong that they have medicinal and therapeutic benefits, just like their neutral counterparts. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you personally have a a favorite chemistry product yourself? Ooh, that's a tough one. A daily driver, if you will. It's like asking me which kid of mine is my favorite yeah. <laughs> I, I have two by the way so <laughs> a boy and a girl and and they're both great um in terms of our <laughs> products yeah it really depends on the time of day um i mean i consume our cartridges a little bit more than our tinctures um that consumption method just is a little bit better for me i like that kind of mm-hmm. immediate feeling and um I'm a pretty experienced consumer too but yeah it depends on the time of day 
I'd say my favorite strain right now. I mean, we've had it on for a little bit. It's in our Uno pod and in our 510 cart, the XJ13. Um, it's just a, it's, you know, off of a Jack Herrera and just a great, lively, energetic one that can get me going from whether it's creative thinking or cleaning the house. Nice. I like that. And on the flip side, um, was there a product that maybe you thought was going to really take up in the market and for some reason it didn't? Hmm. That we've made, I wouldn't, I mean, specific strains or skews maybe that we thought would perform better. Like I said before, those kind of unique, um, specific to a farm ones like we love mm-hmm. that story and i think i think that will be there will be a place for that um but right now the consumers want that you know known strain more than the unique unknown you know yeah grown That's only the on that, that land you're seeing. yeah i'd say that was our you know the few little ones that we've seen like didn't perform as well but i don't think we've had any total hits and miss <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh that's good that, that's a really uh, good place to be um what about general trends because i know it's always like a it's a feedback loop right you bring products to the market and depending on how much they sell or not you increase the supply or not so um do you have any trends that you could share with me across california and the concentrates the tincture the vape world sure um well, I'd certainly say that, you know, live is probably the, the trend of the year or the year plus. Live resin is the 2020 trend? Yeah, I mean, it really picked up last year, I'd say, in 2019, and it's stuck definitely in this year and evolved <clears throat> into, I think, even new categories where you're seeing live, not just in, in vape. Um, so I'd say that's the main one and something that, of course, we continue to think about. Um, mm-hmm. As it stands thus far, we have cured products so we work with smokable weed (laughs) and make products that taste like your smokable weed like i said Mm. before like our farmers are like wow that tastes just like my strain and that's that cured profile and why we're trying to like educate on that why that is going to be a different taste profile than your live um there's a place for both for sure and something we're working on like how we can with our methods and our techniques make live products as well. Um, But thus far we have cured products. And again, something that we just kind of highlight that this is like a smoker's extract. Yeah. Versus that like, cause you will, you know, you can't smoke wet weed. Um, I could try, like I said, I harvested some this morning and it won't be very (laughs) fun (laughs) and it won't taste very good too. Like you will honestly have different components too. Like predominantly, of course, those are going to be monoterps that you can find in cured weed too. And could still even dominate. Like I said, that XJ13 is, I think, like 4% terpinaline or something. And that's a, a banging amount of a monoterp in a cured product. Um, but, you know, in the curing process, things happen. You know, sugars are broken down and terpenes are oxidized. So you get that a little bit more complexity and sometimes even better taste. You know, if you smell fresh weed, sometimes it smells a little grassy or like hay. Mm-hmm. Um so, like I said, something we're working on and how we play in that kind of game and I think in that trend, I mean, which it is. But again, I think it's, they're both going to survive, I believe. <clears throat> but like, I think consumers will understand that nuance between them. You know, maybe live is for a specific type of experience you're looking for and the cured is more, you know, a, another, a different one. Think of wines, right? Like, I think that's a great an analogy that we, we often use and love and one of our farmers actually shouted us out on PBS with that analogy. He's like, I'm the grape grower and chemistry is the winemaker. And, mm. you know, I think, you know, people can identify with that because wine has become quite popular here in California as <laughs> Napa, Napa Valley and Sonoma Valley have become, you know, the dominant growing places for wine in the U S um, yeah. and obviously what cannabis is here as well. Um, you know, much love to all the other states, but I wish California could supply the whole country like it kind of did in, oh, the, in the old days um, when, you know, sour dew was being shipped all over the nation from California. <laughs> <laughs> the good old days. What about new products? Do you have any uh, you know, new product lines uh, on the horizon that you could share without going into 
too much of the the secret sauce um like i did say we're gonna have our concentrates back on the menu um mm-hmm. within the next couple months and on that side we're, we're really focusing at least right now on the potency angle so we're gonna call those um full spectrum diamonds <clears throat> so those are just going to be very potent and what we think are great add-ons you know add it to your joint or add it to your bowl or add it to your food um, whatever it's a versatile versatile add-on um, we like to say amplify your experience with it um, mm. and then you know we'll continue to evolve there too and have some more of the you know terp rich saucy as some people say like extracts as well so we were excited to get back into to that world like i said as we repackage it and rethink it um beyond that like i said earlier it's collaboration um there i can probably just tease there's some things we're working on with a few other companies that we hope to bring to the market later this year or early next year that um, expand, you know, where chemistry oil is found, to say the least. Um, yeah. You know, kind of like going back a little bit to our roots of like not just being a brand, but like also collaborating and working with others. So, you know, like Peridot may not exist anymore, like publicly, but like what we believe is that chemistry oil, chemistry full spectrum oil has places elsewhere. And with like-minded operators and um you know we would like ourselves to be thought of as a fair trade full spectrum source Mm. and um so i'd say keep uh keep your eyes peeled for some of those as they evolve but uh sadly i can't quite reveal them yet (laughs) (laughs) totally cool well i appreciate your time paul and uh really giving me the the background on you and your brand and your vision for the future of the market. Uh, is there any one or anything that uh, maybe we missed today that you'd like to give a shout out to? <sighs> well, <clears throat> like I, I think I did say my team and our farms, I mean, yeah, much love and respect to all of them. Like I said, our team is smaller, but um, everyone is still so determined and passionate and mm. um, bring their good energy here day after day and help bring our products to the market and to the people. And, you know, what really humbles us is the feedback we get from people. You know, we get, like I said, to that info at email box, like people just tell us their stories and it keeps us going. It really keeps me going. I mean, you know, from the mother saying that our medicine helped her little baby stop having seizures to, you know, the old fart that says I can sleep now, (laughs) (laughs) you know, so it's those things that really keep us going. And then, like I said, our farms, like we just took a trip up um, to Mendocino a couple of weeks ago and got to see some plants pre-flowering and visit our farms. And, you know, like I said, we just respect and look up to what they do so much Mm -hmm. and we wouldn't be chemistry wouldn't be anything without our farms. Um, we tell their story for a reason because, you know, they, this industry was built because of them and, and, yep. and we stand on the backs of them and all the other leaders that came before us, you know, in the, standing on the shoulders of giants, Yep, whether it's in cultivation or manufacturing or, or advocacy and policy or mm-hmm. criminal justice reform. Like there's so many people that we look up to and that we're just glad to be a part of this. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Paul. I hope to uh, go visit you guys sometime soon and uh, film an episode at one of those farms and uh, get to see your your process as well. Yeah, we look forward to that. But in the meantime, we hope you stay safe and healthy, and uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. Of course. Thanks for joining us today on this episode of the Canna Cribs podcast. I really hope you learned something new. It was pretty fun getting to know Paul, chemistry, and the overall concentrate market in California. Thanks again to Jim and his team at Hub Insurance for making this episode possible. And if you haven't checked out our other series, they're all accessible on our YouTube channel. You can watch Canna Cribs, Deep Roots, and of course, the Canna Cribs podcast. See you on the next one.